afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Jay Patak. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, M&A in Asia. So it's not going to be limited to India for a change, but India is part of Asia. So you will see some examples and, um, and, and other uh, sort of war stories, which I'm going to push my panelists, esteemed uh, panelists, to do. Uh, a couple of, just a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves uh, because they'll be best able to do that. Uh, I would, uh, of course, go over the edge if I had to do it for them. But go ahead, Shantanu. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Shantanu. Uh, I manage corporate commercial affairs for Lupin. Mm, I'm New York and India qualified. I worked in various law firms around the world before returning to India in 2014 um, and spent a couple of years at CIPLA as uh, global head of m and We did a large number of deals around uh, Asia and the world. And I'm looking forward to being able to uh, discuss some of that uh, with you today. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Girish Bambani. I'm the business head for Bosch Thermotechnology in India in SAC, uh, taking care of the complete business, starting from sales, manufacturing, service, and so on. Prior to this role, I was the strategy partner and M&A head at Bosch, uh, and before that, worked with a few more firms. Thank you. Looking forward for an uh, engaging session with you. Hello, everyone. I always call it graveyard session because after lunch, people want to sleep. I might fall asleep. Please sorry me for that. Um, so yeah, so I'm Vivek Mittal. People call me Dr. Vivek Mittal. I'm a PhD doctor. Don't confuse me with MBBS doctor. Uh, <clears throat> I work for Danaher Corporation. It's a US conglomerate. Uh, in life sciences, diagnostics, medical devices, dental, and a few more things. I look after their Middle East, Turkey, Africa, and India region. Uh, it's a quite large region. I, I look after their diagnostic side. Uh, Danar is a pretty large, as I said, and we, we recently did one large acquisition of G's Biomed business of about $21 billion. Uh, prior to that, I was with Lupin. I used to be the general counsel and uh, did about 15 acquisitions there across globe and probably about five to 10 big, large licensing deals. So reasonable experience in a minute. That's, that's a lot of experience. I can assure you this is uh, going to be an interesting uh, session. Most importantly, I would uh, be extremely appreciative and grateful if we could have a lot of interaction. So I'm going to, <clears throat> we're going to have this for about 40 minutes and then about 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A, okay? So don't feel shy, put up, a, put up your hand and ask questions. There's never a silly question in M&A because, you know, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, if we don't get it right, it leads to litigation. And I know we've got some litigators here who would love for us to mess it up, okay? Um, three quick points I want to make. Uh, okay, by the way, I should mention that there was supposed to be one panelist. Uh, so we had in-house lawyers and, and real deal makers here. We had business people. We had an investment banker, uh, uh, Shreen Nivas, who unfortunately... Uh, Shriram, sorry, Narayanan, who unfortunately was called away at the last moment, so he's not here. And this seat is kept for a PE guy. Uh, uh, that's, the, that's Himanshu Dudeja, who is the general counsel of Blackstone. Okay. So let's get going. I want to make three points about m and in Asia. Okay. One is a very generic point, which is the first one. And, and this is more recent now. The first point I wanted to say was that Asia continues to remain a M&A and investment hotspot as far as the world is concerned. And uh, from my own experience, we've had some really big ticket deals. Uh, I and uh, I didn't do all three, but uh, certainly the first one, which is the Uber Grab deal, okay, out of Singapore and throughout the ASEAN. I'll talk to you a little bit about that because it was interesting. It started out as a share deal and then became an asset deal for several reasons. We don't need to go into all of that. So ultimately, this deal was done as an asset deal across nine different jurisdictions. So <laughs> I learned a lot about Cambodia and Myanmar and Vietnam that I might have not otherwise, because normally you would think of the bigger jurisdictions there like Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Philippines. Um, the second point I wanted to make, and again, I'm not gonna dwell too much about it or on it, is the fact that throughout this region, not just in India, Singapore and some of the other major jurisdictions in the ASEAN, you have uh, the promulgation, or if I may say, the enactment of bankruptcy and insolvency codes. 
that you might think does not have an effect on MNA, but it has a huge effect on MNA. Okay, uh, and and again, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it. One of the things that we see in bankruptcy laws throughout this region is the so-called moratorium period, when um, and I, I can see some of you shaking your heads in, in agreement, where un, unlike other bankruptcy laws, uh, during this moratorium period, it's like you keep everything quiet, you keep it on status quo, and that allows people to do a lot of things, particularly the M&A guys, to get into action and actually resolve issues, not through Chapter 11, but you know, sale of their assets or companies, okay? Uh, the third thing I wanted to say is on the regulatory front, and again, I don't want to sort of um, step on other people's toes because you'll hear a lot about, or may have uh, already, about antitrust issues and uh, dominant, uh, dominance of the market kind of issues. But when we're talking about Asia, uh, without picking particular jurisdictions, because I know there'll be other panels doing that, uh, you will find that in Asia there are certain jurisdictions where uh, antitrust and uh, regulatory issues are given a lot of uh, a lot of importance. In others, they're not. And in some instances, um, uh, and, and we've gone through the Uber Grab deal, which is still uh, you know an issue in Singapore. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. There are perceived violations, okay, uh, where the competition authority may think that there is a violation when in fact they may not have been. Um, talking about the other deals, we were also involved in the. Walmart Flipkart deal, and on the investment side, we were involved in the Toyota $500 million investment in Grab after the Uber Grab deal was over. So now, enough about this. I want to turn it over to, our, uh, to this wonderful group of uh, panelists. So I'll start with Shantanu right at the end. Uh, and Shantanu, as he's told you, he's uh, uh, in the pharma industry, which has seen a significant amount of M&A activity uh, in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, I, I just wanted to ask you, Shantanu, uh, in what way have M&A deals changed sure. uh, in terms of the focus? Sure. So I think, thanks, Jay. Uh, so, you know, I mean, this isn't necessarily an Asia-specific point, but what's happened is where Big Pharma went through this phase of aggressive consolidation. Can you guys hear me? Is that fine? Uh, Big Pharma went through this phase of aggressive sort of consolidation. You know, you had about 50 uh, companies uh, eventually consolidate and become the 10 largest pharmaceutical companies uh, that you see today. Uh, but they've turned away from that. So you've uh, gone from the big is better model to a slightly leaner, meaner model with each company picking therapy areas, you know, uh, um, you know cardiovascular, so heart disease, or... Uh, diabetes and other sort of uh, 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 sort of uh, metabolic diseases, or uh, neurological diseases, or oncology. So they tend to pick therapy areas and develop dominance in them. Uh, and uh, we've seen a wave of divestments and sort of restructuring of investments. Uh, you know, over the last few years, as some of the larger companies hive off assets hive of subsidiaries, and that's created obviously opportunities uh, for uh, you know smaller and uh, generic drug companies because then they tend to snap up assets. So for example, Indian companies have been fairly active in terms of outbound M&A. Uh, Aurobindo, I think I would select Aurobindo uh, as being one of the most active acquirers uh, in this space. Um, they've bought uh, different European assets. They've bought different drugs and assets and manufacturing facilities from large players like Teva in Europe. And they've just bought, well, last year, towards the end of last year, they bought Sandoz, uh, Sandoz's global oral solids business, uh, which is tablets, capsules, things like that, for $1 billion. Uh, so that's because Sandoz, which is also a, a, a bio, uh, which is a generic company, was looking to move away from the commoditized tablets and capsules business and into biosimilars and complex generics because the margins obviously are bigger there, right? So that's what I mean about uh, you know divestments and a move to a leaner model that obviously results in a huge amount of M&A. 
Uh, we can talk about specific country uh, trends uh, as the conversation develops. So one thing I should talk about is uh, Japanese companies are increasingly looking outwards because, and that's a slightly different, fun uh, that's a function of the fact that the economy, the Japanese economy itself is, has been degrowing for I don't know how many years now. So Japanese companies are using their massive cash stockpiles and debt, they also take on debt to acquire companies outside. Uh, I think the most famous obviously is Takeda's, uh, you know, $56 billion acquisition of Shire. Um, so you have similar trends. We'll talk about uh, China and a few other jurisdictions later, but I would say the trend uh, is uh, for the big to, to strip down. And uh, Singapore, actually, interestingly, is, a, is an innovation cluster. You see a lot of companies sort of rationalizing R&D uh, in different parts of the world, hiving off their businesses and focusing R&D in Singapore. Thanks, uh, Shantanu. Um, so I'm going to uh, pick a businessman's brain now. Um, so l let me ask you, I, and, and I know, Girish, that you've done uh, some amount of work with startups and things. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a startup question uh, as opposed to a more mature, established corporation, uh, particularly in terms of due diligence, OK? Uh, what are the unique sort of risks that you might see in due diligence? And by that, I don't mean just legal or compliance, but also on the business side. And the risks that you see in those due diligence, particularly dealing with a startup, how do you mitigate that? How, how do you find ways to get around some of that? So that's an interesting question. So um, we have to realize one thing. When it comes to startups, the team is small. The bandwidth is always a question mark. And in this context, whenever we talk of due diligence, it has to be extremely lean and agile. It cannot be the full-blown due diligence that's done from one corporate to another with 400 odd questions. And in this context, the first and foremost risk which comes in is, is on the valuation part itself. And this is where the founders will always have some hypothesis saying, hey, this market will grow by X, right? And the whole valuation is being banked on that hypothesis. This is exactly the point which needs to be probed really, really deep. Because it's easy to actually make a transaction happen, but difficult to actually generate the actual synergies from that transaction. right? So this is first and foremost aspect which needs to be covered. Second, if you look at a uh, lot of the startups, uh, they may not be following all the required statutory or compliance aspects. Let's be very fact. There might be some or the other form which they had to fill up and they have kind of missed that piece, right? Very small in the scheme of things. Let's not harp on to those. But more important is, at end of the day, ask the startup founders to do disclosures. Trust me, it really works very different if you sit across the table and tell this guy, hey, why don't you open up? We will do a due diligence where obviously all functions would be looked at from legal, finance, and so on. But if you ask the founder and if there is that trust factor, a lot of cost and effort can be saved up front. And you know what you are up to. So these could be a couple of things which could be tried out. Jay, I want to add, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to add something is that um, I've dealt with both kind of companies. One is very established, old 50, 60, 70 year old company acquisition and also startup. I think for a startup, what, what works much better is that you actually go to them and tell your expectations in advance. Yeah. And you help them prepare themselves for you. Right. I think that works pretty fine because we have, we have applied that approach earlier. We have gone to them. We have said that, hey, we are a large conglomerate or large multinational company or large, yeah. Yeah. large company. And when you are presenting things to us, this is how you should be presenting. We can help you get those agencies who can do that. We can help ourselves you know, to tell you, probably get and do a call every week. So this is a completely practical aspect uh, which, is, which is there. So that's one. For, for, for older companies, uh, you know, of course, DD plays a very, very big role. And uh, I think, in my view, larger question is always integration. You can acquire any company. Acquisition is an easier part. I think the most difficult part is integration and how you run the company in day to day. That's interesting. 
so, uh, and I don't want to make this into a question and answer session <laughs> right yet, but it does bring me to a point that I thought I'd uh, ask on valuation, because you raised valuation, sorry Vivek, I'll just come to your question in a second. Uh, do you find, and, and by that, it's not just an issue for startups, but it could be mature companies as well. Uh, do you find um, that on the question of valuation, you find like a generational gap, okay? <laughs> between the founder who thinks that, and actually this was a question for Himanshu because PEs have to deal with it, uh, a generational gap where uh, you find that the, that the guy who started the company or the promoter of the company thinks that the valuation should be something X plus something. And then the younger generation that I might have gone like you guys have and done their MBAs and things outside who's saying, hey dad, you know, cool it because you know, reality is something else. Do you find that come up a lot in your, in your dealings? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, and this is exactly where uh, it's more of the expectation management, right? Uh, imagine somebody sitting on the table and saying, hey, I need a comparable, which I've seen something similar in my space, right? If somebody is in the e-commerce, they'll say, I look at how Flipkart has been valued, right? Give me that kind of a premium, which is not going to happen. And the best thing to do here is stick to the classical DCF. Yeah. I am a big fan across all the evaluation methodologies, pick up DCF, ask this startup founder to really go explain why he will be generating a certain cash year on year basis in the future to command that valuation. And this is exactly where the sense comes on the table, the rubber meets the road and expectations can be calibrated. Thanks. I'm sorry for the background noise, but this is just making us feel more like Bollywood than we should be. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but the point that you made about due diligence and almost to the point where you actually have to uh, bring some amount of coordination and discipline to the other side of the table uh, when you're a buyer is, is a very important point. And I'm sure as Dana here, you probably hate your lawyers telling you that, that you know, you have to give me some more money because I've had to discipline the other side and coordinate that. I, I want to add it that actually I've done that in, okay. in Lupin. And we were acquiring one company uh, in Latin America and we actually paid our lawyers more so yeah. that they can get into call with other side and help them prepare their data room. We have done that actually. Oh good, so I'm glad to hear that. That's a sigh of relief and I'm sure that's to a lot of uh, private corporate practitioners. But okay, let me just actually, this is a good segue into that next question. When you're dealing with M&A and for Danaher and for you, what is the, are there parameters that you're looking at? And I'm sure every fact pattern is different, but would you rather go for majority control I mean, or control? Or would you, would you think in terms of a minority uh, investment? So uh, mostly uh, I can tell you that Danher approach is that we buy out. Yep. Uh, but in my previous organizations, it's a hybrid approach depending upon market to market. There are various reasons why you want a previous promoter be in the company. Maybe it's because of your, you, you want him to run the company the way he is projected and you based his, uh, base, base his uh, you know, price on earn out model. That's also there. And you say that, okay, if you, if you remain in the company, you make this company reach to that valuation level which you said, right. we'll pay you this much. Yeah. So that's, that's maybe one approach. And some, some countries it's based on maybe regulation. So we, at Danaher, we have a joint venture in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. There you need to have a local partner. So that's based on regulation. So this approach varies from transaction to transaction. I don't think um, any company, any sensible company would say, no, no, irrespective will buy majority. I think they would also say that, okay, let's look at the deal. Let's look how it's gonna shape up. Let's see how we can structure it best. Uh, and, then, and then take it forward. Just to give you one, one more example, uh, last year we at Danaher announced that we are going to hive off our dental business into a separate company. Um, but later on we decided that we better off bringing the IP of the company and retain 80% in it. Right. So right. then this company remains our subsidiary. So this is also part of m &A, right? Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So uh, approach is different for, for each different company. Yeah. And I'm going to ask Shantu somewhat a similar question. But, but just, I mean, I think, I think you're right in saying that. And by the way, uh, I think it's right to point out that sometimes you may not get to 51% or 50.01% because you don't want to consolidate those operations in your accounts. 
equally, and I think this is where Vivek was going, and certainly Shantanu will tell you, you can have less than 50%. And so technically speaking, under the law, you would be a minority shareholder, but it doesn't necessarily mean that when you're writing the contract or the shareholders agreement or the investment agreement, that you cannot have control on a vast number of, uh, vast number of issues, so much so that you're actually running the company, even though for consolidation reasons, you may keep it at 49. So let me, let me go to Shantanu. Uh, yeah. and, and would you, in, in, in your experience, would you rather, particularly in the pharma industry, would you rather choose a joint venture kind of scenario or would you go for an outright 100% acquisition? Yeah, you know, I, as Vivek was saying, there are many factors that go into it. I, uh, but I would like to take a couple of minutes to talk about uh, yeah. the pitfalls, right? Uh, the cons of joint ventures. If you have, uh, if, if you own the company outright, right, then you control its destiny. Um, you, uh, uh, things don't work out, maybe you divest, uh, maybe you take a write-off, whatever. With a joint venture, things are infinitely more complex, right? If, the, if, if business conditions change in the country, uh, you can't just uh, pull out. Your joint venture partner has a say in it. Uh, if, if you want to change the strategy, joint venture partner has a say in it, uh, has, has a say in it. Uh, if he decides to be difficult, it can impair your revenues from the entire business in that jurisdiction. And of course, these are again relatively minor problems compared to the sort of problems you find in particularly difficult jurisdictions, right? Uh, let's take Russia, for example, let's take China. So uh, some of these very, very difficult jurisdictions. And ironically, these are the same jurisdictions where you really can't operate without a local joint venture partner. It's very difficult to do business in China without somebody who can get you on the inside with the regulators and so on and so forth. Same with Russia. Russia, you just can't do business uh, without a local partner. And of course, the worst that can happen in these situations uh, is you walk in one day and you find the company isn't yours anymore, quite literally. Right? There's a couple of armed... This happens in Russia all the time. I'm not even exaggerating. You walk in and there's a couple of armed guys with AK-47s at the door and they say, your company, ha-ha, it's actually our company. Yeah, and of course, uh, moving on from you know extreme situations like that to uh, you know the uh, danger of loss of IP in China. You put your IP into a joint venture in China. Suddenly, miraculously, your joint venture partner has the same IP, which he's using for an independent business. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you put you you, you you contribute capital into a Chinese company, and suddenly, oh, I, sh I should really shouldn't be talking about specific countries, but yeah, I mean, I've had experience in some of these countries, and so it still rankles, as you can see. But yeah, some of that uh, suddenly uh, embezzlement. Suddenly, money starts flying off the books a little bit at start, and then it's a steady trickle, and somehow all of that money is conveniently ending up in your joint venture partner's new ventures. So. Girish, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe I'll just add on to it. So if we look across, there's a lot of convergence which is happening across sectors, right? It's not the classical auto anymore. It's more of the mobility domain. It's not the power anymore. It's more on the electrification as a domain, right? In this context, when we especially talk of JVs, companies have to go for these because most of these areas are talking of new age technologies where one company alone cannot survive. Neither one company has all the competencies when we talk of these industry convergences. And this is exactly where joint ventures make a lot of sense. One, there is pooling of resources happening. Second, the risk is going down. You can take multiple bets, but eventually it will, you are not risking the whole company. You are risking only a small investment. Those are instances where personally I believe joint ventures really makes a lot of sense across the globe. Excellent. That's a very good point. Uh, so let's, let's talk about uh, in m and situations, whether it's a joint venture, controlling, uh, you know, controlling investment that you put in, uh, or it is an outright acquisition. There are synergies that you think might work, but they don't, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, how do you, uh, l let's ask uh, Girish, you as a businessman, how do you uh, mitigate those uh, when, you're, when you're negotiating the M&A process, and how do you mitigate against that post-closing? Thank you. Uh, again, a good question. So let's say while we are undergoing this M&A process at the negotiation stage, uh, there are a couple of things which is worthwhile to do. First, focus on the 95% rule. What do I mean by 95%? At end of the day, the value of the business would be boiling down to one or two parameters which is contributing to 95% of its growth. What are those? Is it really the technology? 
Is it the brand? Is it the people? Or is it something else? Unless and until we don't have an idea of those two, three parameters contributing to 95%, it's a question mark. So let's assume we identify these two. The second part which needs to be done is at the valuation stage, figure out how is cash being generated. Because typically if you see, top line is vanity, bottom line is sanity, cash in bank is reality. And in this context, and where we talk about risk, we talk about these aspects, the cash in bank really matters, especially for corporates. Unlike where we see money is going into startups, money is being burned, somebody else will come in as a taker, right? But for corporates, it's very important from the cash in bank over the years. So if you know precisely what are those, you have to keep questioning the why part. So these are two things which can be done during the negotiation stage to really figure out what's the true value of the company. And second part, what kind of synergies can be generated, which needs to be again calibrated, not just in-house by the corporate m and team or the business side, but across the table along with the acquiring company. The second part of the whole story could be post acquisition. How do you really generate those synergies and avoid the typical pitfalls? In my personal experience, I've seen one, if you have a high level sponsor in the company, somebody at a board level who is constantly coming on the table maybe once a month or once in a quarter to steer the whole thing, the synergies can actually get generated. Because many a times that top management attention, especially at the board level, may or may not be there post acquisition. This is where a sponsor really comes in. The second part which could be worthwhile to try would be make these acquiring company sign up for a certain amount of earn out. Take 100% ownership, tell those guys, especially on the acquiring side, you want a certain premium, we'll give you provided you achieve four parameters. And this is again coming purely from experience. The earnout has to revolve around revenues. The earnout has to revolve around profitability. The earnout has to revolve around cash in bank, which is generally missed out. And last but not the least would be people. Because it's very easy you acquire and you realize the A team of this whole enterprise suddenly goes out in one year. So if we are able to combine this earnout structure along with the sponsor, this can really help generate the required synergies and avoid a lot of risk from a synergy realization. Thanks. Go ahead. Go. Yeah, One yeah. thing is that I always say, I, I don't think we should, and I always t advise my, my internal clients is that don't disclose what synergies you have. Synergies right. are for yourself. Keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, what what we used to do is that uh, in our current organization we prepare a valuation model, and uh, we we say mean, medium, large, and the medium is where we are not considering synergies at all. And we say that whenever we are going to offer anyone, we are going to offer on that medium rather than the large. Right, right, right. Yeah. So so I think that's one way where even if those synergies are not coming in, you can still be satisfied that, that that's okay. Deal was fine. Just to add on, uh, in fact, even in our case, we would actually not disclose up front. But what a typical approach I have seen a best practice, make the other party calculate what kind of synergies can be generated from their lens, which can also serve as an input internally to the team which is calculating this whole piece to challenge the assumptions. Great. So, so we'll perhaps come back to this in the Q&A session, and I don't know how much more time we have, but one Last question, perhaps, to you, uh, Vivek. If you're looking at M&A and evaluating M&A, what are the three, and I'll keep it to three because of the time uh, constraint, three topmost risks that you see, again, generically, and, and how do you try to resolve those in your experience? So this is kind of like a war story, okay? The three topmost risks that you've seen, how do you try and resolve it during the course of negotiating the M&A deal and perhaps post-closing? So first one is people, yeah. clearly. Uh, if those people are not there, then company is not running. And especially in countries where, uh, which are not English speaking, you'll not be able to go and take control because they are, those are conservative, com uh, conservative countries. So let's say Latin America is one of them. You go there, they're, 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 their emotional quotient is as good as Indian. 
Right. They, they, they work on people rather than, you know, actual actual business sure, model. Sure. So first thing will be people. So what, what I would always suggest is that ensure that first they are good quality people, what kind of contract they have, how long they're going to stay with the company, interview them that if you're going to take over, then what's your, you know, are you comfortable, sure. et cetera, et cetera. And then probably bind or, or bind this with the, with the, with your, with your uh, share purchase agreement somehow. That's one. Other thing is revenue stream. I can give you one example which I saw myself. <coughs> In one of the companies we were acquiring, we got to know that revenue stream from was from a government tender. And that government tender was purely and purely relationship based with the promoter. What we found out when we probed later is that about 80% of that company's business was based on purely relationship of that promoter. And if he's out, then probably those authorities or those agencies will not see this company in the same fashion. So that we ensured that, okay, how do we, how, how, can, how can we ensure that this revenue stream comes clearly? And third thing is actual property, real property. You know, one of the deals which we left is because that company's uh, manufacturing facility was on a land and that land was controlled by 27 different companies yeah. through various structures. So whatever price you're paying, you're paying for revenue, you're paying for assets, and you're paying for people. That's, what, that's, that's how at least I look at it. And these are the three most important things. If these things are there, then probably if you're in the same field, then probably you'll be able to run this company even if you know something goes wrong. Excellent. So I, I hope you've been listening to this because there's a lot of very good actual experience and practical experience that they're talking about. Okay, it's open for questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Nabik from PNL Law Offices. And this, this, is, this is a query which actually uh, would be uh, Anthony would be better in a position to answer at the same time, the risk part of it, and the due diligence part, which I has taken up very effectively. You see, uh, as we understand that there has been a tendency towards single therapeutic uh, uh, medical, you know, joint ventures in regard to companies which are not going and getting into too many drugs, or say a particular uh, therapy drug concerned joint venture, I mean, uh, acquisition, which are happening, which are being preferred now because they are smaller. Now, uh, you see, when it happens as in regard to the drugs, say a drug which today is doing well internationally, also nationally, it is subject to certain regulations, subject to patents, and also subject to the internal policies. So now when you go ahead to make a joint venture proposal and when you're looking at the risk factor part of it, how would you hedge the risk in regard to the future of the product? Because tomorrow, if a patent application is lying in America of that particular uh, product, which is doing very well in America, but you never know whether the application would be, would, be, would be extended or not, number one. Secondly, whether during, because of certain policy changes, the drug in India is suddenly said to be a drug which is not safe. Like say, Entorquino. We thought that Entorquino was a very good drug. It was to be used. And suddenly something came out like, you know, that is not good for the eyes. So this kind of product-specific issues and risks which are there, how do, would you be able to hedge that risk when you right. go in for this kind of thing? Thanks. Right. So if I can summarize the question, essentially, when you're acquiring a company that's focused on a single drug for its revenues, how do you mitigate uh, risk? This is, uh, and that's not an unusual situation, actually. A lot of companies... Uh, acquire uh, entire corporations uh, only for their, uh, you know, sort of uh, their their marquee drug. Lipitor is an example. Pfizer acquired uh, the company um, pr primarily for Lipitor. Um, so uh, I, I guess, look, I mean, one is uh, it's a question of the time in the sense that this attitude itself has changed over the years. In the old days, you would just buy a drug at an early stage of development and sort of roll the dice uh, now, increasingly in the last few years, we've seen decreased appetite for early stage assets. You tend to buy after the product has cleared phase three. So at least you have a certain degree of clarity as to 
you know, what the approval, uh, you know, where we are in the approval process. Beyond that, of course, in the agreements, what you do is, you know, you can sort of structure, uh, you can you can back end part of the consideration. You can say, I give you, uh, you know, maybe 20% now, 30% once it clears, once it's approved in this com uh, country, uh, and then, you know, so essentially you structure an m &A deal like a licensing deal, where, uh, you know, the money goes to the other side as the value comes to you. That's one way of doing it. Uh, there are, of course, uh, and of course, if that doesn't work, if for whatever reason the guy has leverage, he has multiple buyers, which again happens very often, then you just sort of do diligence, understand the regulatory framework as best as you can, and then you try and see if you can get indemnification from him if certain key, uh, you know, key milestones are not met. There again, he will qualify it by saying, well, if they're not met due to my due to my, uh, uh, you know, uh, inaction or uh, to any fault attributable to me, then I'll indemnify you. But then again, proving fault in a situation where you just haven't gotten the thing is complicated. So, uh, you know, at a certain level, I think you have to front end the analysis. There are, there are contractual tools that can help you mitigate the risk, but, uh, so you it's know. So it's a combination, a combination of feasibility, proper feasibility due diligence, depending on the development of the product, plus, doing some kind of an earn out, which is essentially an earn out, uh, coupled with a forward looking rep and warranty, if you will, yeah. or a covenant, if I can call it that, with yeah. an Forward looking reps are tricky though, I mean really, you know. You or, know or, or a covenant. A, maybe yeah. a covenant yeah. Yeah. Again, covenants, the tricky part is it's not really within your control, right? Will the patent be uh, issued? Will the patent be challenged? Will there be a 180 day So how about keeping an escrow or, or, yeah. I think the or hold back? Yeah. Or, because then you've got cash that you're sitting on that the other guy naturally should be having. Exactly, so that was the first thing I said, which is you structure the M&A deal like a licensing deal such yeah. that the consideration flows to the other side as the benefit of the asset comes to you. So maybe, yeah. So uh, I can also add is that uh, mostly in these kind of deals what I have done, I mean we normally, so why someone would part way with his, uh, with his uh, development? Uh, mostly because of uh, de-risking, right? De-risking himself from the investment which he's doing. So in that case, what happens is that we would go and first assess what's his funding need. If his funding need is, just to give an example, I was I was doing a, a product which, uh, which was supposed to be $800 million in probably next 10 years or, or maybe five years of launch. We asked him, what's your funding need right now? Right now? He said, three million. No. We said, okay, we'll give you three million. As it goes forward, we will actually continue to acquire in the product, and we also tied it to probably FDA filing, FDA approval, you know, if someone sues you for, for infringement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes a very, it, it, it requires a very meticulous approach. It doesn't require lawyer's approach. It also requires a pretty technical approach. We have, you need to sit with technical guys and you try and understand how this product is developing. And then, Finally, what we did was we said that, okay, when this product is launched in market, in first five years, we will actually get our money back. So your share will be 5% in the revenue probably. Okay. And then when it goes forward, your revenue revenue stream will increase. So there are multiple ways how you can structure it. But it, it again, depend upon each kind of deal. Tracks of the deal. One more question, uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, because I'm getting some dark looks from the organizers who are, who are hiding behind uh, tables and saying, okay, you've got just one more question. Okay, so anybody? All right. I mean, look, this is a very, M&A is a very exciting um, part of legal practice, and uh, it, it actually leads to a lot more. Uh, I mean, it, this, being an M&A lawyer means you've got to know, you've got to be a jack of all trades, and, and hopefully you'll be master of some of them, okay? Because it really takes across the broad spectrum of, of how a company runs and and, and it's very exciting. I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Do not, and I know, and, and perhaps the one only thought, uh, you know, people look down upon due diligence as being something that only junior lawyers should do, okay? That is very, very wrong, okay? When you go, <laughs> you go to buy a shirt, you go buy a shirt, you want to make sure it's got all the buttons, right? That's what you do when you buy a company. Your reps and warranties are based on due diligence. So I would really urge all of you people who are senior, and this happens, by the way, across the world, uh, across the board, they will hand it over to junior people to do due diligence. It's right to hand it over to junior people because that's a question of economics, okay? Because they've got lower rates. But remember, due diligence is your bedrock for all M&A work, okay? So do not 
look at it as a you know, less than desirable work to be done, okay? And the second thing I wanted to say very quickly, because I've talked about this too with my panelists who are all in-house, et cetera, if you want to be a really good corporate lawyer, and I say this to all the young people I meet, uh, not to managing partners of law firms, but to all young people I meet, go in-house. Go in-house for two years. Learn what business people really want. And let me tell you, they don't want a thesis on jurisprudence. They don't want to know that this case law says this and this case law says that. They've got an attention span of literally half a minute or two minutes. They're going to say, what, this is my question. Tell me, is this right or wrong? And give me and make the judgment call whether I should do it or not. They're not interested in the jurisprudence. You will be far better transactional lawyers if you go, went in-house, spend a couple of years, and then, you know, so be it, come out again, okay? That's my second piece of advice or suggestion to you all as, as sort of M&A and corporate lawyers. That's all. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for all your time. As somebody said, this is the dark hour when you want to go to sleep. So thank you for being awake because I'm trying to keep, uh, trying to see if everybody's eyes are open in spite of the lights here. I think I've noticed everybody's eyes were open. I saw a few toothpicks as well uh, to keep them open. Uh, but most of all, I want you to thank my panelists who really spent some time thinking about these issues and I'm telling you, they did think about all these issues. So thank you very much, each one of you. Thanks.